You know, there's a guy called Usain Bolt, and he's one of the fastest people, or maybe he is the fastest person alive right now. And there's another guy called Eminem, or Slim Shady. Now, he's changed the face of hip-hop, right? So now everybody knows that they can do something just because they want to do it, right? And that's what they did. That's their legacy. What is going to be our legacy? And when I say our legacy, I don't mean just you and just me. I mean all of us here in this hall, the so-called Y generation. We have to leave our mark. See, nowadays we've got the tools, we've got the platforms to be able to share messages instantaneously around the world. And it gets me to think, what would have Plato? Now, Plato was an ancient philosopher in Greek times, a very brilliant mind. What would he have done with what we've got today? What would have Steve Biko done with what we have today, right? The tools, because he was a, a great thinker as well, and he was South African, and he was the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. Now, with all the tools we have, we've got the ability to be great. The so-called Y generation has the ability to define themselves. For example, if we can think of how powerful the youth is, we can think of what? Facebook, right? We can think of what happened in June 16, right here in South Africa in 1976. And we can also think about what happened in the Arab regions of the world, where youth from Tunisia and Egypt basically said, you know what, this is what we want. We want a government to be like this. So we're going to work towards doing this. So what did they do? They practically went into the streets, and what they did is they made sure that the government that they want will be the government that will govern them. And that's what they're doing right now. Facebook, June 16, Usain Bolt. Huh? Eminem, well, a little bit, he's a bit older now. The guys from the Arab regions, they're all youth. All these things are initiatives led by youth, because what youth are powerful. Maybe I should give you an example of what happened to me. When I was in primary school, I was given a chance to paint a, a picture of the future of uh, 2025. Now, I was really young. I was like in grade five or grade four, and, and I didn't understand what 2025 is going to look like. I mean, right now, can you think of what 2050 is going to look like? So before I was given a, cho a chance to paint something like that, I watched a play, a play about environmental issues. Now, that play informed me to paint something like that. So I went through high school, and through high school, I was given a chance to come up with a, play, uh, with a project, and a project which addressed the social issue in my community. So I come from a township in, in, in Johannesburg. It's not really Soweto, it's Deep Kloof. And I almost lost that it was actually Soweto. <laughs> now, what happened there is that I had to come up with something that showed the effects of pollution. While I was going through that, I then found out about global warming. When I found out about global warming, I found out about climate change. Now, the thing that freaked me out about climate change was that not only in 2025, but in 2050, if the global temperature increases two degrees in South Africa, it will be four. So that freaked me out. So if I'm chilling, you know, watching TV or chilling outside playing soccer with my friends, and we play normally it's 25 degrees, we're knocking the ball around or playing basketball, we're going to be playing in 29 degrees? That's hot. That's really hot. So I was like, you know what, maybe I have to do something about it. So I got a bit freaked out, and I was like, ugh. What else can I do? So then I started getting involved, so finding out more. What happened is then I started learning about the link between energy and climate change, and the vice versa, and how they both work. Because any, any number which you can think of is basically like this. Like the greenhouse gases that we have in South Africa, or in the world, 60% of them can be attributed to the global energy sector. So what means is that because we've got all this energy and electricity and the cars, all those fumes that go up, are basically driving climate change even faster. So I was like, okay, that's really freaking me out. So I said, let me get more involved because I'm really passionate about this. So I went into um, what we call the NGO sector. 
And in the NGO sector, I got to travel a lot and to meet a lot of people around the world. What happened is that I started visiting places like the United Nations conferences and negotiations. And what happened is you start hearing things like north and south. And you're like, what, what, what's this? What's this north and south? Because I know northern suburbs and southern suburbs. Well, what's this north and south? So this north and south is basically countries which are developed, which are north. America, UK, Japan, whatever. And the south is all the developing countries. Lesotho, South Africa, China, India. So what made it worse is that when you talk to the young guys and the older guys, now the young guys from the north, they're really smart. And it's not because they're smarter than us. No, no, no. They're just smarter than our parents. You see? So now the problem is that by the time we are the ones who take the decisions or have to take the decisions, we're going to have to keep up with them. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that then. I'm going to do it now. So what am I doing now? I'm getting more involved because what's going to happen is this. If we don't get involved in pressing issues and world issues early, we're going to have to play catch up with them. And then they're going to still make the decisions while we are saying, hey, all the things that are happening in the United Nations are done by people of the North or people of the South. So we've got to change that. So I'll ask you again, what is your defining moment? What is our defining moment? My passion is in active citizenry, the ability of a person to be able to influence laws and policies. I think that's really great. So when I was in varsity in high school, I thought the best way to do that was to become a lawyer become an advocate or become a judge. That didn't turn out well. <laughs> yeah, no, that didn't turn out well. Because I don't think, thinking, uh, looking at the past, the retrospective stuff is really worth it. You've got to think about the now and the future. So now I'm more like a policy analyst. And the best thing about me, what I am, is because I didn't have to study what I'm doing now. So that's great. You see, I'm having a whole lot of fun. So let's think about this. Think of Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Uh, think of Nelson Mandela as just lawyers. Yeah, think of myself as just a lawyer too. You know, um, think of Mark Shuttleworth as just a businessman, the guy who went into space, who changed all our ideas about what, astro uh, what being an astronaut or being a South African is. Do you remember him? Think of Richard Branson as just a businessman. There's more to you and me, everyone here, than the social designation. See, the previous generation was able to leave their mark and leave their legacy. The question is, what is our legacy? What will we be remembered for? What is our defining moment? Thank you.